Right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here. This is our second cannabis seminar um, of 2018. Um, we ha held one earlier this month, and we had to do a second one by popular demand. My name is Paul Michael Keichel. I am a partner at Schindler's Attorneys. I've been involved um, in the cannabis case since uh, the Dacher couple joined us in 2013. But I'll tell you a little bit more about that later on. I'm going to be handling a few introductory aspects as to how we got involved in the matter, what the law was prior to judgment, and what the law was post-judgment. To my left is my colleague, Andrew Laurie. He is a candidate attorney at Schindler's, and he'll be taking over from me and telling you the intricacies of the law, the, those finer details that I won't really cover in my introductory. Portion. And to the left of Andrew is Kyle Telfer. He's an associate at Schindler's. He's been involved in the Dacher matter as well for a number of years. Uh, he's not going to be speaking to you initially, but um, at the end of the seminar, we're going to be opening up the floor for some questions, and Kyle's going to be fielding some of the questions uh, for us because he likes to debate and argue with people. So that's uh, that's. <laughs> well, there we go, there we go. We've, we've, we've got the client himself who can attest to that. So um, I think without further ado, let's, let's get on with it. Um, so as I said, we will open up the floor for questions, but if, if, if there's something that you really don't understand during the seminar, please feel free to, to interrupt me. Um, the only caveat is that you must then remember, you must then remind me where I was. Because uh, if you get me lost, then everybody's going to be lost. So, this has been a long journey, and obviously you guys are all here for different reasons. Uh, some, of you, some of you just want to know whether it's legal to smoke at home, what, what it means, uh, what, what, what is a private space, uh, how much cannabis can be used for personal consumption. Some of you have industrial ambitions, some of you want to grow some industrial hemp and knit some socks. Uh, it's completely up to you, but um, how we got involved is actually quite a, quite a long journey, which started in, uh, when would it have been? I think 2004, end of 2004. I'd just completed my trick, and I went on a trip, Euro trip with my brother, um, and part of, part of that trip was Amsterdam, and I found myself in a coffee shop smoking a rather large joint, uh, quite a potent one, and enjoying myself, <laughs> and thinking to myself, wow, isn't this incredible that I'm in this relatively functional society, the sky hasn't fallen, we're not surrounded by dysfunctional drug addicts, um, and I also feel a lot less intoxicated than I do when I drink alcohol, so that was really the genesis, and I then went to Rhodes University and I, I started studying law and I took introduction to law, introduction to constitutional law, and then the juices started flowing and the ideas started forming as to how could we possibly structure a legal argument for the decriminalization or legalization of cannabis in South Africa. And fast forward to uh, 2009, I had opportunity 
to do constitutional litigation. And strangely enough, it's actually, um, this, is, this is a departure, but, but it's the fault of this man sitting here, Cameron Billing, because <laughs> the year before, he had convinced me to go out with him at the end of exams instead of studying for my exam, and I failed that module. And it was only from failing that that I then needed to create a timetable clash in my final year of law, and the only thing that would create a timetable clash and mean that I didn't have to sit another round of lectures was to take constitutional litigation. So cannabis is actually decriminalized today because of Cameron Billings. Okay. Yeah. I'm not sure he even remembers that. <laughs> So I wrote this essay in 2009, and one of the, my main sources in the essay was a gentleman by the name of Craig Patterson, who is a historian, and at the time he was studying at Rhodes, but he was described by the <coughs> HOD of the History Department as knowing more about the, the topic of uh, cannabis history in South Africa than anybody else. And he, he provided a lot of material for the essay, but... but once I'd finalized the essay, he also had a final draft, and with my permission, he provided that essay to, to some of his friends, being Jules and Myrtle of the Dacher couple. And fast forward to 2013, the Dacher couple actually found themselves at Schindler's Attorneys, um, having been sent here by the pro bono.org department in order to register their non-profit company. So they weren't, in <coughs> fact, here to see me. They were speaking to another colleague of mine who then said, well, hold on, you need to speak to this chap, Paul Michael. And, you know, bells started ringing in their heads and they realized that I was the author of this essay. So I was called down and to cut a long story short, um, they had been looking for legal representation uh, in their cannabis challenge for um, a number of months and had been turned away by a lot of law firms. And uh, through some begging, pleading and pulling off some strings, we we decided to take them on pro bono. Um, and it was a serious challenge. And what, what, what happens with constitutional litigation is that although there's a reverse onus with something like this, and I'll explain the reverse onus in a moment, you, you, you need very strong evidence in order to prove this because there are these questions as to the harmfulness, the medicinal effects, the societal effects, what it's going to do or not do for our economy. Um, the historical rationale for prohibition, etc. Um, so we knew immediately that we needed a very high caliber of expert witnesses. Um, and the, the person who was assisting us at the time was the late uh, Robin Stranson Ford, advocate Robin Stranson Ford. Now he was very good friends with uh, Mario, Dr. Mario Ambrosini, who some of you might remember was the, the IFP chief whip who actually stood up in parliament, put forth the, the Medical Innovations Bill and came clean to the whole of South Africa that he himself was a cancer sufferer and was using medicinal cannabis to alleviate his symptoms and to treat his cancer. And Robin Stranson Ford was a very good friend of his. And, you know, there was, as, as you would all appreciate, those, those who either partake in cannabis or who are for cannabis will speak to one another. And, and um, it, was, it, it was Robin who ended up being our advocate and who, who told the Dacher couple, in fact, that they needed to register this NPC. Uh, actually, that was their former attorney for very reason that you would need this high caliber of expert witness and this is going to cost a lot of money. The sort of money that you can't just expect two individual litigants going up, the government, going up against government to come up with. So we get all of our ducks in a row and with the trial set to run in 2015, we file our expert witness, uh, our expert witness summaries, which is it's it's a legal requirement that you have to do. You have to notify your opponents that these are the experts who we're going to be calling, and this is what they're going to say, and that that gives them the opportunity to study those and to come up with contrary evidence and contrary arguments. And it was at the eleventh hour when we were supposed to exchange these expert witness statements that the state said, "Well, hold on, we're actually not ready." Um, we, we, well, if you read between the lines, we don't really know what we're doing here. We need to scrounge around and, and find people who are willing to speak on our behalves. And they convinced um, the, the Pretoria High Court to give them another two years. So we had the trial set down for 2017. Um, the other thing that 
would transpire the state wasn't ready for is the so-called reversal of onus. Uh, what, what happens in usual litigation is that if you're the plaintiff or if you're the applicant, as, as the saying goes, he who, aver who, who averse bears the burden of proof. So if you're making the allegation or if you're, um, if you're making the claim, it's up to you to lead all of the evidence to justify it. But constitutional litigation is, is slightly different because all that you need to do as a litigant in constitutional litigation is to say, well, I've had one of my fundamental rights as written in the constitution infringed. The onus then shifts, it then becomes the state's onus to prove that that prohibition is rational and justifiable and reasonable in the circumstances. There's a whole test which is set out in section 36 of our constitution. And for whatever reason, it seemed until only about halfway through the first sitting of our trial that the state seemed to deny that this was actually their, their onus. And what would ultimately transpire is that we went to trial um, at the end of July 2017, July running through August 2017. And we started after some very annoying scuffles with the state who didn't want us to live stream, go figure. <laughs> they, they didn't want this evidence being out there in the public domain. Um, we, we, we got underway and we started leading witnesses. And unfortunately, one of our main witnesses, Dr. Donald Abrams from San Francisco, had to fly home because the state had wasted so much time. Um, and we were able, though, to lead the expert witness uh, testimony of Professor David Nutt. Um, may I presume that everybody's familiar with Prof. David Nutt? what he has to say on the scale of harms. Um, and we led Craig Patterson, the man who was my main source in the essay and who also gave my essay to the Dacha couple. Unfortunately, it was rendered part heard because although we had allocated a month to the trial and we thought we were going to finish within a month, the state, when they finally woke up to the fact that they were facing this huge challenge and they had this burden, uh, re and realizing that they were unprepared to meet that challenge, decided to just flood us with as much documentation as possible. So in the space of about a week, we were hit with upwards of 4,000 pages of every single study under the sun, which upon later analysis, 99% of which actually supported the case that we were making. <laughs> um, but but that, was, that was their tactic, and unfortunately the trial uh, well, that portion of the trial concluded in, in August 2017, and we were then left a little bit in limbo because we had run half of this trial and now we needed to apply for another date. And um, even if you get an expedited date, you're talking in the region of a lot of months or even a number of years, but another month for the judge's time to, to hear this kind of matter. But in the meantime, as all of you know, there was that matter in the Western Cape High Court that was heard in, or we had judgment, I think, in February of 2017, which was Judge Dennis Davis and two other sitting judges, a, a, a full bench, um, where they had essentially ordered that the laws prohibiting and cultivation of cannabis at home by an adult in private are unconstitutional. And that was now going on appeal to the Constitutional Court in November of 2017. So while there's the intention of carrying on with the trial, we realized that we would be somewhat naive if we didn't intervene in that matter because not amiably far on their own, but Gareth Prince and Jeremy Acton, etc., were unrepresented individuals. So they were legal lay people, and while they had a significant amount of evidence and they knew what it was, or they knew what the rights were that they thought were being infringed or that they alleged were being infringed, they, they, they weren't really able to construct a coherent legal argument of the sort that constitutional court judges are used to dealing with. And we were a little bit concerned that if we left if we left them to just run that appeal, we might be left with a we didn't like. Um, and this is a judgment of the highest court in the land, which then could have a contrary effect on our judgment. So we managed to intervene. And it was in November last year that we um, 
presented argument as did Gareth Prince and Jeremy Acton and the Khoisan tried to intervene, etc., etc. And that's the judgment that ultimately resulted earlier this year, in September this year, which decriminalizes the personal and uh, the, the personal possession and use and cultivation of cannabis in South Africa. So where this takes me to next is a question of, well, what was the law before that judgment? And what is the law after that judgment? And unfortunately, the conclusion this evening is that not really all that much has changed. I mean, it's, it's, it's changed a lot for the average uh, cannabis user who really just wants to sit at home on his couch and get stoned. But uh, it, was, it was all on the basis of the limited right to privacy that this happened. And so when it comes to industry, etc., as I'll take you through, not all that much has changed. Now, in terms of the personal use and possession of cannabis, prior to the judgment, you would refer to the Drugs and the Drugs Trafficking Act, sections 4B and 5B. And there is a, a general prohibition on the use and possession of cannabis, um, and there is a prohibition on dealing in cannabis. Now, dealing is widely defined. I'll take you to a slide a little bit later so that you can read that. Um, but what, what is interesting under sections 4B and 5B is that the prohibition is only about three lines long. Um, I'll, I'll read you in terms of the, the, the use and possession of drugs. It says, no person shall use or have in his possession A, any dependence producing substance or B, any dangerous dependence producing substance or any undesirable dependence producing substance. That is the prohibition. And you've got a mirror provision in respect of dealing in section 5B. But then those, those three lines over there being the prohibition, you've got the word unless. And then everything follows underneath it. And this unless in both 4B and 5B is the real mouthful, but I'm not going to take you through it, but what, what you see even prior to this judgment is that there are a lot of references to the Medicines Act and a lot of references to pharmacists and dispensing, etc. So already now, they had it in mind, although not specific to cannabis, that in certain circumstances, if you have the right licenses through the former Medical Control Council, now SAPRA, and through the Pharmacy Council, there were these exceptions that would allow you to get your hands on prohibited substances. What everybody used to talk about back then was the so-called Section 21 application, which was to say that, well, if, if you're really, really sick and there's nothing else that's going to help you, then through your doctor you can make application to use cannabis or any other unregistered medicine. The problem with that, of course, is that with so much red tape and with uh, the, the stigma attached with cannabis, the, there were no such licenses that were granted uh, for two reasons. The, firstly, the first one being that it was incredibly difficult to demonstrate, as was one of the requirements, that there was no other medicine which would do the same thing. So for example, if you were an epileptic, it would be very difficult to say to the, to the, the MCC, well, I'd like to use cannabis for my epilepsy, they would say to you, well, you can use Tegretol or whatever, whatever other medication. The other problem associated with it was that it doesn't allow you to just use anything like cannabis. Cannabis is what will later be described by Andrew. Um, it contains things called APIs, active pharmaceutical ingredients. Those ingredients are then used to manufacture a medicine. So you now have a medicine that's not registered here, but in order to get it in terms of Section 21, you need a medicine registered overseas. So it's not just a case of, I want cannabis, and then you can import raw bud from overseas. You would need to have found, at the time, a cannabis-based medicine, such as dronabinol. There was, there was one such medicine that we knew of that existed back then, which you could then import. But what we know is that um, certainly no licenses in terms of Section 21 were granted that we know of. Um, if any of you know of anybody who historically got one, please bring them to us and then I will alter this presentation. <laughs> but that's, that's what the Drugs Act said. There was also the dealing provision, um, which as you know you 
prohibited from dealing. Everybody understands that dealing is the exchange of cannabis for money, and there are other nuances to that. But there was this presumption, which was that if you were caught in possession of 125 grams of cannabis upwards, you were presumed to be a dealer. And what that meant was, again, one of those reverse onuses where instead of the state having to prove beyond reasonable doubt that you were dealing in cannabis, it was presumed that you were dealing in cannabis, and then you had to present all of the contrary evidence to show, no, I'm actually just a heavy smoker and I was storing for winter or whatever the case may be. <laughs> Now, CBD has only recently started emerging as something that is considered traditionally separate to cannabis. Well, not separate to cannabis, but largely when we talk about cannabis, we always think about getting stoned and THC. And it's in the last, what would you say, Jules, in the last decade that people have started waking up to the fact that there is... Six years. Six years. Yeah. People have started waking up to the fact that there are all of these other compounds, cannabinoids that, that exist in the cannabis plant, each with their own uses, etc. And we're not going to get into this whole argument about the entourage effect that you really ought to be using them all together in order to achieve the, the same purpose. But CBD has been isolated and, and, and certain uh, positive effects have been associated with it. Now, it was actually prior to the judgment. In fact, uh, I believe just before we argued in 2017 that there was this move by the MCC to reschedule CBD. Um, Andrew is going to explain to you what that rescheduling means, but what it says is that, um, ah, I can move on to one slide, even though it's not the correct slide yet. That's, 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 that's section seven of the medicines act, just, I'll move on to that for, for hemp fiber. CBD, um, it's, it's been moved to schedule Four. So it remains in Schedule 7, but in Schedule 4 it says that it's Schedule 4 if for medicinal purposes, which, you, you know, you, you, you start entering into this debate of, well, if it has medicinal benefits and the World Health Organization has acknowledged that it has no psychoactive properties or negative side effects, what's it doing scheduled at all and how could it be? for anything other than medicinal purposes. It's, it's like suggesting that you're drinking water recreationally. Um, as, as somebody in the room who's present here once, once pointed out to me, um, you know, water, I suppose, could be recreational if you're using it to flush MDMA out of your system. But, uh, that's, that's more of a joke than a real argument. <laughs> But, but, it, but it does highlight the absurdity associated with leaving something that's non-psychoactive and non-harmful as a Schedule 4 substance. Um, but bear in mind that all of these scheduling uh, and all of this scheduling and these regulations and the Medicines Act, these are all throwbacks to a time long ago when people hadn't woken up to the possible medicinal qualities associated with cannabis and other psychoactive plants and chemicals, etc. So bear in mind that we are dealing with really old regime laws. So that's, that's what happened prior to the judgment in respect of CBD. Hemp, this is where my slide comes into play. This was one of the exceptions to Schedule 7. But what you see in respect of hemp is it doesn't really help you very much. It doesn't mean that you can grow it because it talks about processed hemp fiber containing 0.1% or less. So given that you need something to process in order for it to be processed and then it's going to be unprocessed before you process it. What that really says to you is that you can't grow hemp in this country. So what this says is that you can import processed hemp fiber. So there is no real hemp industry in South Africa. You can import some fiber, knit your socks, do whatever you want with it, but, and then on sell it, but only if it meets those strict criteria. There were, there were certain instances of people getting uh, license to grow hemp, but it's always been in partnership with the MCC and the Department of Agriculture, and then they get this so-called research permit, which was that they would give them permission to grow, call it an acre of hemp, and then every little, uh, every little gram of fiber or of, of biomass that was grown then needed to be given to the Department of Agriculture or to the MCC for research purposes. And then they would say, all right, well, uh, we're, doing, we're doing a viability study. And then years later, there would be no results. And nobody's heard back 
and then all of this money has been put into growing this hemp field and there's been no payback and no progress from a legal or legislative perspective. So those are how we define it. In our speech really we've got cannabis but there we're really talking THC. But when we talk CBD we're talking non-THC and separate to the entourage cannabis plant and then we talk hemp. So we have this judgment earlier this year, what does it really mean? And we have the personal use by adults in private. And they also start talking about cultivation. Uh, it means what it sounds like. It says that in the next two years, while, well, the, the judgment declares certain portions of sections 4B and 5B and certain portions of the Medicines Act as unconstitutional to the extent that they prevent a, an individual from consuming and uh, cultivating in private for their own use. But in those two years, it is a defense to a charge under those that, uh, that you are doing it for those purposes. So then of course we, we ask the question, oh sorry, that's, that's the rescheduling that we were talking about. So. You, you, you see that schedule four, and then it says cannabidiol when intended for therapeutic, uh, therapeutic purposes, then there's the reference to schedule seven, so it remains up there. So this is the, this, this is really what, what, every, what got everybody excited. This is the real change to the law. Um, there's not much outside of this that, that constitutes a real change. Um, and you'll notice that what it says is invalid to the extent that they make the use or possession of cannabis in private by an adult for his or her own consumption in private a criminal offence. So then we ask ourselves, well, what does this mean? What, what, what is in private? Um, the Constitutional Court goes, goes into quite a lot of detail as this, um, around this debate. And they say, well, privacy or the concept of what is private is like an onion that has many layers. But to cut a, to cut a long story short, um, a private space is not limited to the home. There are going to be private spaces outside of the home, although they don't give you a definite list of what those are or even a genus of what those are. And they also acknowledge that people are going to be moving between private spaces with cannabis on them. So what can we infer from that? Well. You certainly can do it at home on the privacy, uh, you know, in the privacy of your living room, so long as there isn't a, a youngster around you or a non-consenting adult. And then, hypothetically, you want to now go and meet up with your friends at your private cannabis club, and you want to take your cannabis with you, well, you can put it in your pockets or you can put it in your backpack because those are private spaces. You, although you're moving through all renders of private. So we're reasonably confident in telling you that, that that's what the judgment means, but of course, as Jules will tell you, um, the cops and the prosecutors certainly haven't woken up to this fact yet. So don't rely on what we tell you as sacrosanct, although we are 99% sure that we are right on this, um, it doesn't stop you from getting arrested. Ultimately, this is only going to be a defense if they decide to prosecute you. Does a car count as personal space? We believe it does. We believe it does, for the very fact that, um, for example, at a roadblock, they need re reasonable suspicion or a warrant in order to be able to search your car. So yes, it, it, it is. They need, to, they, they need to have reasonable suspicion that you've committed uh, a, an offense. And carrying of cannabis in your car wouldn't be an offense. In fact, um, you know, just, just going back to a story, and I can't remember who exactly it was who told me, not that I could tell you anyway, but uh, she, was, she was driving home one evening and she had, uh, I don't know, two gram banky of cannabis sitting in the, the, the center console and she was pulled over at a roadblock. Have you had anything to drink? No. Do you have anything, well, do you, do you, do you want to declare? Have you done anything wrong? And she said, well, I actually do have some cannabis in the book that, that This was so forthcoming, but, but ultimately the police officer just sent her on her way. Didn't arrest, didn't search, nothing of the sort. When did that happen? After, like the, after the judgment. After the judgment. It doesn't mean you can smoke and drive, though. No, it certainly doesn't mean that you can smoke and drive, because that's a separate crime. 
Dri driving under the influence of drugs is a separate crime, and nothing in, in, in this judgment has, has done away with, with that being a crime. Um, what is personal? Well, sorry, before I get on to what is personal, this is, this is the definition of deal in prior to the judgment. And you can see it's, it's not only the exchange of, of cannabis or of drugs uh, for money. It talks about all manner of concepts, transshipment, importation, cultivation, collection. What the reading in has done really, and this is, this is I think paragraph 11 of the order, is that after cultivation, but before the comma, they've put in that whole blurb, unless it is for personal use by an adult in private, etc., etc. So not that much has changed in respect of dealing, although there is an argument to be made because of, I think it's paragraph 86 of the judgment that says that um, any act in connection with the cultivation of cannabis um, is, is lawful. So it might be that transshipment, importation of seeds, etc., may be lawful, but... Can you maybe just elaborate in terms of administration? Administration, well, yeah. if, if, if you are... Well, what, what, what does an administrator do if, if, if your job, although you're not selling the cannabis, but is to receive the cannabis and yeah. make sure that it gets to all of the recipients, you're now administrating, administrating cannabis? Um, but, but, you know, all of these, each of these terms uh, will, will bear a different definition and ultimately it's what, what, what we're pushing for is a purposive or purposive approach on the judgment. What did the judgment want to allow and um, what must it necessarily allow in order for effect to be given to the judgment? But I think this is a debate that we can get into um, once, once we have the questions at the end. So if you do have a question around that, even if it's a hypothetical, just park it for now. Um, th this, is, this is what the judgment had to say about dealing. Uh, but before I get on to that, it was talking about, well, what, what, is, uh, what is personal use? What the Constitutional Court didn't do is tell Parliament that everything over 125 grams or everything over 3 kilograms is dealing. They said, we're not going to step on Parliament's toes. You guys are the lawmakers. You must do your research and you must speak <coughs> to the experts and you must come up with a rational and reasonable limit to what constitutes personal use reasonably. In the meantime, and it's a little bit alarming, um, they've left it to the discretion of the police in the intervening two years. So can I give you a definite black and white answer as to what is personal use? No, I can't. You have to start thinking like a grumpy police officer or a grumpy, uh, a grumpy prosecutor. The analogy that I use is that if you're walking down the street with a backpack and you've got a kilogram of cannabis there and it's just a block of cannabis, you might be able to argue that it was for personal use, that you're taking it from your mom's house to home and that you're going to smoke it over the course of this next winter. Or, contrary to that, if you're walking down the road with a backpack and a kilogram of cannabis in your backpack, but that cannabis is divided into bankies of two grams each. Yeah, it's going to be very difficult to convince a police officer that you had to divide your cannabis into bankies of two grams. So think like an arresting officer, think like a prosecutor, don't be stupid, err on the side of caution. If in doubt, don't do it, really. Because um, again, we can probably prevent you from being prosecuted and getting a criminal record, but we can't prevent you from being arrested. That's up to you. Um, yeah, seeds. Seeds is a very uh, seeds is a very grey area. Like I said, you've got the purposive or purpose of uh, interpretation on the judgment. It seems, on a strict reading of the judgment, that you can only really source your seeds. Um, by way of donation from somebody who grew cannabis. But then of course it begs the question, if they grew that cannabis knowing that they were going to give away the seeds, did they grow that cannabis for their own personal use? So there are these gray areas, but um, there, there, there might be arguments to be made, but we keep referring to test cases. Um, if you want to be the guinea pig or the test case, by all means, please come speak to us. 
we're not going to encourage you, but uh, we need answers. So if you're going to <laughs> if you're going to if you're going to take the risk and do it anyway, we would be happy to represent you and to make arguments on your behalf, etc. Industry. I'm going to allow I'm going to allow Andrew to explain what industry exists and what doesn't. But what you have here is really what they're saying in relation to dealing. So they've said you can do what you want at home. <coughs> But no money can change hands. Um, while they say here that, um, sorry, it's not the same quote that I was looking at, but um, we, what they say is that where there's a sale, there's a purchase, and if uh, if you're purchasing, you must necessarily be purchasing for a dealer from a dealer. Um, it's a grey area as to whether you are committing a crime when you purchase cannabis. Uh, there is some authority that says that you're not committing a crime and that it's the dealer who's selling it to you to commit a crime. But again, just be careful. You don't want to get caught in the middle of that transaction and find yourself a test case unless you want to be it. Um, so, this relates to the discretion. And what is nice about the discretion that was given to police officers is that what the Constitutional Court says is uh, when you're in doubt, rather don't arrest. So you can take some comfort that, at least on paper, if not in practice, the police are supposed to be arresting only in the clearest cut of cases. Okay, Andrew's going to be moving on to that. So I'll just leave that up there. Um, in relation to CBD, without stepping onto Andrew's toes. Uh, we have met with SAPRA, which is the new MCC and the Pharmacy Council. And they have confirmed to us what our reading of the law was prior to our meeting, which is that nothing in the way of medicinal or industrial cannabis has changed since the judgment. So all of those laws and those regulations and those license applications that I hinted at earlier that existed prior to the judgment those are still the processes today that you need to follow if it is that you, that you want to uh, establish yourself uh, a cannabis industry. In relation to CBD specifically, um, there's, there's, there, there seems to be a lot, a lot of misunderstanding in CBD. Uh, I think most of you will have seen that in the pharmacies you can buy CBD oil over the counter. It's sold under various guises, a health supplement, a nutritional supplement. Uh, you even see these pop-up stores you know, with big cannabis leaves and they're selling the, the CBD vape oil. And when I questioned uh, one of these pop-up stores as to how they are doing this, the, the salesperson who was just a salesperson in fairness and, and had been told what she had been told, says to me, well, no, CBD has never been unlawful or illegal and you've always been allowed to use it and possess it. So, uh, you know, what, what I sort of thought to myself was, okay, Fluffy, you enjoy that and um, <laughs> you, you, you get on with that because if that's what you think, then I'm not quite sure I can help you, but tell your boss to phone me. Because you can actually get into a lot of trouble and the long and the short of it is that if you are selling CBD without the right licenses and without the right authorizations, you are dealing in a prohibited substance or in a scheduled substance. So that hasn't changed. And as much as we want it to have changed, it hasn't. And as much as people are getting away with it, it seems to be that they're getting away with it, not because it's lawful, but because SAPRA and the Pharmacy Council are like many South African departments and uh, and institutions, they're under-resourced and they're fighting battles on many fronts and they just haven't gotten around to it. So if you are in that industry, um, I say just be careful because there will come a point where they do decide to make an example of somebody. It may not be you, it may be you, but, but be careful. And we then move on to hemp. Well, there's been no change in that either. Those, that slide that I showed you earlier, it's still the same thing. Although. Although uh, we have uh, hemp seeds that are readily available and uh, there's a lot of people who, who want to grow hemp, um, there just is no industry. But what has changed is that it does say that you can grow cannabis for personal use 
and consumption in a private space. Now cannabis is hemp, although you've got different strains. So hypothetically, if you're on a small holding and you want to grow a whole lot of hemp uh, in order to make canna bricks or to feed your cattle, technically you should be allowed to do that. The only thing is it's going to be very difficult when the arresting officer starts knocking at your door to say, well, all of this hemp is for me to make canna bricks or to knit socks or to feed my cattle. So some of the advice that we've been giving out is if you are going to venture into that, do it in a manner that would allow you to pass an audit. So, you know, uh, video yourself sowing the cannabis seeds, video the harvest and the fact that your cattle are eating it and that you are pressing it into cannabis and be able to show the house that you've built or the outbuilding that you've built out of cannabis. So it's, it's all just really that if one day you are charged, you are going to be able to convince the judge that this is in fact hemp grown for your own personal use. So that's, that's the only slight nuance to what's changed in respect of him. If you're looking to manufacture a product that has hemp seeds and distribute that like through a normal retail shop, yes. is that considered? Unfortunately, here, um, here we still have Schedule 7 of the Medicines Act, and if you look at C, um, and does not contain whole cannabis seeds. Whole cannabis seeds. But uh, you see, your, your problem, of course, is that you're going to have to grow cannabis because there is no legal distinction presently between hemp and cannabis. And if you're not growing it in order to produce the seeds in order to sell them, are you growing that cannabis for your personal use or consumption? So do you find out that the manure that the cattle produces uh, is good compost and you sell that compost, is that then a derivative of? <laughs> it's, 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 it's actually one of the more creative questions I've been asked. Um, if you'll excuse the pun, it's a bit of a bullshit question. Yeah. But, uh, um, no, I, I, I really, and, and I'm speaking from experience, I really doubt that you're going to find an arresting officer even with the impetus to now suggest that, that manure from hemp-fed cattle is somehow a product that is prohibited in terms of the drug sales. I mean, I, 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 think, I think if the prosecutor were to make the decision, well, if the arresting officer were to make the decision to arrest, the prosecutor would mock them, and if the, and if the prosecutor didn't mock the arresting officer, the judge would mock the, prosec the prosecutor. So I, I, I think that's, that's the kind of layering that, that I think would be safe. Um, you know, similarly, um, I've, I've got it on good authority that, that uh, hemp-fed cattle, actually, their milk contains CBD. Uh, so it's, a, it's, a, it's another gray area. Um, I, I certainly know that you can't advertise the, the milk as containing CBD. Um, that, that's something that Andrew might be able to touch on. He's been doing some research on the advertising of cannabis and cannabis products. But um, to say that the, the cattle were fed with hemp, I don't think that's I don't think that's that's too bad unless but of course then you are commercializing it which yeah. is yeah, it's, it's, it's such a gray area um, you, you you always have to fall back onto what the judgment intended and keep in mind that everything that's in place presently is only supposed to be in place for the next two years hopefully Parliament will wake up and in two years time we're going to have a legal landscape that looks entirely different to how it looks today so it's very difficult to say well, how that will look, and we're certainly going to be making submissions, etc., as to how that should look. But but presently, you know, don't don't tempt fate. Don't you? I know two years seems like a long way to wait, but you know, we've we've been at this for a number of years. The Ducker couple have been at this for even longer. Gareth Prince has been at this since 1998. So it's all relative as to how long we have to wait. So that's 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 the effect on industry. Um, a lot of people ask us about things like social clubs. You know, is it okay that we have a club and we charge for membership, etc., etc., um, and we sell pizza? The real thing that you don't want is cannabis changing hands for money. And it doesn't matter how many layers or how many loopholes you think that you found. I always say again, think like the prosecutor and like the judge. You can say to the prosecutor, oh no, we're charging for membership and then we're giving them free cannabis. They're going to say, no, you're, you're, you're selling them cannabis. 
uh, we've we've got a we've got a term in our law called in Freudum legis, which means you're defrauding the law or you're looking too hard for a loophole, and it's something that that prosecutors and judges have been trained to look for, and they're not stupid people. So so, you know, you might get away with it. It, it might be because you you don't have a grumpy prosecutor, but at the end of the day, it's all going to be a test case if it could be suggested that cannabis is, being, is changing hands for money. So I'm sure a lot of you are going to have some hypothetical questions after this talk. Would this work? Would that work? The answer is probably going to be the same. It may, it may not. Um, it depends on whether you're willing to be the test case. Um, there are certain industries, of course, that objectively are fine. I mean, if you're growing cannabis at home, just like you could grow tomatoes at home or pretty flowers at home, there doesn't seem to be any problem if you get a professional gardening service to come in um, who tends to your cannabis, so long as they don't take any of your cannabis or give you any cannabis. Um, they're, they're providing a service. They're providing a gardening service. That, that ought objectively to be fine, and you could even hold yourself out as being a cannabis expert if, if in fact, you were that. Um, Paraphernalia, etc. I mean, this is the, the the sky's the limit. I mean, traditionally we've we've had shops selling bongs for a number of years. That always has been legal, but but now that people are growing at home, people are going to want lights. They're going to want you know grow tunnels and uh, hydroponics kits and possibly even extraction kits, etc., etc. So if you are able to provide those sorts of products or services. The sky's the limit. You can start making uh, money off cannabis legalization tomorrow, or the fact that people are allowed to grow grow at home. Um, finally, to conclude my section of this, well, what what can we expect, sort of two years time from now and beyond? Well, what the judgment was very explicit about, and this is just how the law works, is that. Uh, the, the Constitutional Court, you've all heard of the separation of powers, and it often gets fought about politically quite a lot. You know, the, 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 the legislature or the executive gets told that what they're doing is unconstitutional, and the Constitutional Court gives them a slap on the wrist, and they say, oh no, you're overstepping the separation of powers. And I think that the Constitutional Court has been reasonably conservative in this. You'll find it throughout the judgment. They say, well, we're not going to tell Parliament what to do. We're not going to tell the cops uh, how much is too much cannabis. But what they did do through allowing personal use and possession at home is they've set a minimum threshold of freedoms. We can never go backwards. It can't be that in two years' time, Parliament all of a sudden creates a law that says that you can't uh, grow, use, and possess at home. Uh, so, so what we then hope for is that they're going to legislate to allow for more liberties. Um, and there are things that we are going to do as Schindler's and as the Dacher couple. And there are things that you can do. Now, one of the questions that's been uh, posed to us and more so to the Dacher couple is, well, what happens to your Western Cape High Court case? Um, we seem to have settled on a strategy, um, and I've been told that I'm allowed to tell you, which is that we are, we are going, sorry, did I say Western Cape? Pretoria, Pretoria, Pretoria um, case, is that we don't want to withdraw it because we don't know what Parliament's going to do. Um, at the same time, we can't really push it too hard because we don't know what Parliament's going to do. So the plan at the moment is to approach the Deputy Judge President for a new date for the remainder of the trial, for the hearing of the remainder of the trial, but that that date is post the two years um, after the Constitutional Court judgment that Parliament has to fix the laws. So in a sense, it's, it's the proverbial gun to the head, which is to say to Parliament, all right, you've got two years, but if you don't do this properly and, and actually liberalize and set a proper or, or legislate so that um, your laws aren't open to further constitutional challenge, well then we are going to complete the trial. And we are going to have to have the judge tell you to do what you ought to have done all along. So, so you know, it's a carrot and a stick scenario. Um, but in the meantime, what's supposed to happen with Parliament is that they're supposed to draft legislation and then there's a public participation, they release the draft to the public. 
and they're supposed to give sufficient opportunity that um, all and sundry can make submissions to them, written, verbal, on application submissions, um, to say, well, no, you haven't accounted for that, or you ought to go further there, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, while we intend to uh, be taking part in that through through the Dhaka couple. Um, you, you all as individuals and collectives should be doing the same thing to the extent that you have an interest. But what, what is very helpful is that Jules and Myrtle are already serving almost as a consolidated or, or, or an arrowhead front for, for a number of interests. So if it is that you don't have the, the personal impetus to, to go to Parliament or to write to them yourselves, uh, when, when the time comes, make your case to Jules or Myrtle. And, uh, we can then consolidate everything and distill it and, and make, make a unified case to Parliament. Um, one very, very important thing, and, and, and this, is, this is something that everybody seems to agree on, is that uh, we require regulation, but there is a risk of over-regulation. If you make the license applications, etc., too onerous and too expensive, um, what are you going to do? You're going to open up the market for the multinationals or the already rich, and you're going to close the door on the small-scale farmers, those guys in the Eastern Cape and the former Trans Sky who are already earning uh, a small subsistence wage off growing cannabis. You know, it's, it's, it's really the, it's, it's, it's the African mamas whose husbands, the heads of the households, the, they're running the household, the, the, the the, the husbands have gone off, they're migrant labor, they're working in the cities and you know these these women are very hard working and they, they sow the millie fields and they feed the families with millies and then with that little bit of extra cannabis that they grow they can sell that and they can then afford the school uniforms and the education of their children etc. If we squeeze those people out through over regulation it would be a crying shame so these are some of the submissions that all this is one of the things that I think we all really need to shout loudest about to Parliament is whatever you do leave those guys alone and make sure that we can actually use this as a way for people to bring themselves up out of poverty instead of just increasing the cycle of the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer mm -hmm. so that's it from me um, I will answer some questions at the end but uh, over to Andrew who's going to tell you what you can and can do what you can and cannot do um, in the legislative space as it stands. Thank you very much. Right. Evening, everyone. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about now is a system that was put in place long before this judgment. It reflects a lot of what's wrong with the current cannabis industry. And you'll see that it's almost engineered to keep cannabis out of your hands unless it's in very, very dire circumstances. And yeah, there was, you'll notice that there a lot of interest sparked um, with the cannabis industry when the NTC released their guidelines. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with that. The NTC came out with um, pretty detailed guidelines on what you would need in order to apply for a legal cannabis grow, cannabis farm. And this got everyone excited, very, very excited. I mean, within months they had received something like a thousand applications, none of which have been granted yet. Um, what no one was thinking about though, is what can I do with my tons of cannabis once I've grown it? And the answer you'll find is actually very little. Um, you would be left with tons of cannabis which ultimately you'd have to destroy. Um, so what those guidelines were gearing you up to they were gearing you up to apply for a specific license in terms of the Medicine Act. This license is called the Section 22C1B license, and it's here over there. You can read the whole thing or just trust what I'm about to tell you. Um, what it allows you to do once obtained is import, export, and cultivate marijuana. Now, who you can, well, export is simple enough. Once you've got your license, you can export it. That's fine. That is the most obvious and probably the most profitable industry which has been opened, well, it's been around for a long time now, but that's probably the, the easiest route to making money you have right now. It's also not ideal because we want to keep the cannabis in South Africa. So we're setting ourselves up essentially to be like Lesotho where everyone grows their cannabis and can't actually use it unless you're giving it to the Canadians or the people from the Netherlands. 
Um, so, in, in order to export or cultivate or import, you need that Section 22C license. In order to possess cannabis or handle cannabis in any way, you need a permit from the Department of Health. So now you've already got two licenses all right, that you, you need in order just to have cannabis, just to grow it out of the ground in the first place. So this is Section 22A of the Medicines Act also. This is the machinery by which you obtain a permit from the Director General. So at any point at which you're going to handle cannabis, um, you need one of these. It doesn't really matter who you are. You can be a pharmacist, a doctor, a farmer of cannabis with the Section 22C license. You, you can't avoid having to get one of these as well. So already you can see how it's, it's quite onerous. I mean, you want to embark on this, this journey of, of growing and supplying cannabis, but now you already need two lengthy licenses. And now bear in mind that Section 22C license none have been granted yet, and the first applications went in over a year ago. Um, so bear, bear in mind now what Paul Michael touched on is that we are expecting changes from Parliament. They've been mandated to change certain aspects of our law. That's not to say they have to stop there. They can definitely continue, and as Paul Michael says, we'll be doing our best to make sure they go beyond that and actually give us the machinery we need for a legitimate industry. Um, so the magic of cannabis, as we all know, is in its, uh, it's in its APIs. It's in its active pharmaceutical ingredients. It's the, the CBD, the THC. All right, now different considerations apply to these things. CBD, as Paul Michael said, is a Schedule Four substance. There's less tape around that, but I'll, I'll start with with cannabis and the red tape that being Schedule 7 invites. So cannabis is defined as cannabis, the whole plant, or any portion thereof. That means seeds and that means hemp. Our law considers that to be cannabis. So as soon as you're talking about seeds, as soon as you're talking about hemp, you need both of these permits that I've just gone through, the Section 22C as well as the Section 22A. The seeds and the hemp are Schedule 7 for all intents and purposes. So. When we're talking about things like CBD and THC, we're talking about APIs, as Paul Michael touched on, active pharmaceutical ingredients. Now, these can't just be sold to anyone. They, in fact, they can only be sold to manufacturing pharmacies. All right? You can't sell concentrated CBD or concentrated THC to the public. Those need to be sold to manufacturing pharmacies, who in turn will use those ingredients to create medicines. Medicines are what can be sold to the public. So as, as I'm talking, you might notice there's an increasing gap here between the end user and the grower of cannabis. Now, there is no machinery currently which allows you to obtain a license, grow cannabis, and sell it to the public. There's quite a vast interconnecting web of licenses and institutions that come between the grower and the end user. So I've already talked about the permit as well as the Section 22C license. Now, that gets the cannabis out the ground. What do you do with it then? So if you don't export it, you'll sell it to a manufacturing pharmacy. The manufacturing pharmacy will then distill that down to whatever they need, whatever CBD or THC concentrates they need in order to synthesize other medicines. Those medicines, once synthesized, have to be registered before they can be sold to the public. Uh, the registration process takes up to five years. SAPRA has, been, has told us that. Um, five years. So now. That's to register a medicine which contains APIs. Now, if you think about a cannabis plant, what does that do? It contains APIs. Cannabis right now is thought of as a medicine. So if you're talking about registering medicine, and that takes five years, we're talking about registering each strain of cannabis, which will take five years. Now, we all know how many strains of cannabis out there. Well, we don't know the total, but we have an idea. It's lots. So the current regime doesn't leave really any room for the sale, the growth out the ground and then the sale of cannabis to the public. You now have to register these things as, as a medicine. On top of that, the grower can't even apply to have it registered. The grower has to turn it over to a manufacturing pharmacy who then has, has to synthesize a medicine and register that particular medicine. On top of that now, the manufacturing pharmacy has to sell that medicine to a wholesale pharmacy. The wholesale pharmacy can then sell it to a community pharmacy, which is like your disc, your disc M or clicks. Then they can sell it to the public, provided that person has a prescription. <laughs> so there's three pharmacies you have to go through before this medicine is grown off the ground, registered, and ready for, for public use. 
So there's arguments to be made about why that's the case. I mean, if you're talking about a medicine here, you need something consistent. You need to know what your patients are using. Um, it has to be quality, the quality has to be controlled quite tightly. When you're talking about medicinal, everything has to be better. Controls have to be tighter because you don't want to be the doctor that prescribes the wrong thing um, to the patient. And on top of that, you don't want to be the pharmacist who supplied it or labeled it incorrectly. So it, it's tight um, for good reason, I'd say, but it can afford to loosen up on this particular medicine here. Yeah, I mean, no one's ever died from cannabis, and I don't think, aside from someone maybe being a bit paranoid, they're not actually going to, it's not going to be fatal, giving them the wrong thing, which is why there is room to, to loosen the grip somewhat. Um, so now, when we're talking about supplying CBD, it's a Schedule 4 substance. So the first barrier that gets removed when you're talking about a Schedule 4 as opposed to a Schedule 7 substance is that you don't need this 22A permit. All right. Um, in fact, you, with CBD, uh, once again, it still has to go through that whole shebang of being included in a medicine before it can be sold to the public. You can't just sell raw CBD or CBD concentrates to the public. It has to be included in a medicine. Um, so really, the only barrier that's, that's removed is this Section 22A um, permit. So once a CBD-containing medicine has gone through the process of registration, it's taken its five years, and it ends up on the shelf in a pharmacy, the person who's buying it needs a script. You need a prescription. So despite what um, you may see out there now, uh, it's, it's very illegal for someone to sell you um, a Schedule IV substance, a Schedule IV medicine, if uh, you don't have a script for that. Um, once again, why this is necessary, we, we don't know, and we hope it'll change. Um, the CBD, largely, once again, it won't kill you. It's, um, it'll help you sleep better, sure, improve your skin, but I don't think it'll kill you. I don't think it warrants the same kind of registration, um, warrants the same kind of protection as something like Marpidol. Um, and just for interest's sake, Schedule 7 is the same schedule as methamphetamine, which is currently how our law views cannabis for industrial purposes, um, which is crazy. So. So the Section 21 application, which Paul Michael touched on, um, that is currently the only way which an end user can obtain CBD. I'll touch on cannabis and why it's not possible through that mechanism for now. But um, since we have no registered medicines in South Africa which contain CBD, and we won't for at least five years if the laws don't change, since that's the case, the only way you can actually obtain it is by way of a Section 21 application. So what this allows you to do, it allows your doctor to apply on your behalf to SAPRA to obtain an unregistered medicine because it's the only thing that will work for you. You've tried everything else. This is what the, the doctor now has to put forward to SAPRA. And the only thing that will work for you is an unregistered medicine. But that, that's not to say they can just import any unregistered medicine from anywhere. The, the particular medicine has to be registered in a recognized jurisdiction. So the list of recognized jurisdictions actually hasn't been shared with us yet, but um, I'd say somewhere like Canada would be recognized. Things, places like the Netherlands, you can't just go to any random country and find a medicine you like and then tell the doctor to get it for you. The doctor has to make a case. They have to lay out a dosage regime um, and justify um, why does he need that particular medicine that's registered elsewhere? So this hasn't worked for cannabis yet. Um, or, but by the way, for CBD, CBD containing medicines, there have been about 30 successful cases. And the Section 21 application process doesn't actually take that long. It takes about five days. So if you really are suffering and you need CBD, there's nothing stopping you from approaching a doctor and obtaining it like this. But Unfortunately, you're not going to be able to walk into a pharmacy and just sort yourself out there yet because if you can, the pharmacy is breaking the law in the first place and you probably are by not having a script. No doctor can actually write you a script for a medicine that isn't registered here. They, can, they have to go through this. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, so the reason why it's more difficult with cannabis now is because that particular doctor also has to have this going back Section 22A permit. Um, these, 
I don't, I, we haven't heard of anyone who's even registered for one of these. No one really knows that you need them. So I can't tell you how long it'll take, but if it's anything like the 22C license, you're looking at at least a year. So this poor doctor now, who just wants to help a patient, now needs one of these, as well as a section. Even for CBD? Yeah? Even for CBD? Even for C no, because CBD is not a Schedule 7 substance. Um, for CBD, the Section 21 by itself is sufficient. That's all a doctor needs, and then he can actually import it. Um, which invariably ends up happening through a pharmacist. The doctor will approach a pharmacist, the pharmacist will identify the correct medicine, and then they'll import it um, with the Section 21 application having been done on their behalf. Um, excuse me, just finding myself. So, yeah, that's, that's, re that's really all there is to it. I mean, nothing's changed. As I say, this, this whole thing is just designed to put red tape and keep cannabis out of the hands of the general public, except in very, very rare cases. I mean, with your Section 22C license, which everyone got all excited about, thinking now we can grow cannabis, we can supply it to whoever we like, when in fact all you can do is export it or give it to a pharmacist, a manufacturing pharmacist. So now why on earth would a manufacturing pharmacist want to buy tons of cannabis when there's no registered medicine that they can use it in? They can't integrate it into anything. So you can see how your supply is cut short in cannabis. There is really nowhere to move the cannabis you grow in South Africa. I mean, there's no one can use it for anything really. CBD is the same, because in order to locally produce CBD, we need a Section 22C license to grow cannabis, extract the CBD, or well, a pharmacist will have to extract the CBD, but once again it falls flat because there's no CBD registered medicine, and there won't be for five years if things carry on the way they are. So as far as... Um, grower to end user, there is simply nothing yet. Um, if you want CBD, you can grab it, you can get it for a doctor to apply on your behalf and they can bring in a registered CBD product for you. Um, with regard to cannabis, we don't know of any successful applications for it yet. Um, and even if a, a doctor were to embark on that process, they're now faced with having to get this Section 22A permit, which takes more time and makes it more difficult for them to get cannabis. And invariably what, ha what happens is if you in pain, you'll get a painkiller. If you need your appetite back, there are other drugs that are catered to that specific purpose. It's very hard to make out a case on why you want cannabis in particular, other than you want to get high, but that doesn't really <laughs> fly when you're applying for, <laughs> for licenses like that, unfortunately. Um, so as far as the industry goes, those are the limitations in place, um, clearly designed to make it difficult for everyone. And the reason we think that they're not going to be around for too much longer, A, we know that Parliament has now been mandated to get off their ass and make something happen. B, what the Constitutional Court judgment has done is they've acknowledged that this is not particularly harmful. This is not something that needs or warrants such protection. If we, all as private adults, can now grow it and use it, in the privacy of our own home. I mean, I don't see anything, any similar ideas floating around about meth. That's in the same schedule as <laughs> cannabis and for all intents and purposes treated the same as cannabis. So we've got this public policy now, which is informed by the Constitution and what the Constitutional Court says, saying that we accept as a country that cannabis is okay for us to grow and use personally. But as soon as you wanna make an industry about it, you need all this red tape and all these licenses and something like that simply can't stand now. I mean, if we. We can't wait five years for every single strain of cannabis we want to be registered um, when the court has said you can grow whatever strain you want right now, today. So there's a logical inconsistency there that will have to be mowed out if, if, if um, this judgment is to really mean anything for the cannabis industry in South Africa. Um, so yeah, that's the reason why we, we believe they're gonna change and why we're gonna try our best to, to move that process along think as a community from all reaches of, of life when it comes to cannabis, from us, the lawyers, to the users, to the patients, to the doctors, we all have a role to play. Um, and these next two years are the time we do it. We have the, the means in place. Uh, we have the a couple of spearheading the, the whole thing, what could go wrong. Um, so yeah, the best thing to do is get involved, keep educating yourself, um, come to things like this, go to other ones. Please please go out there and if you can remember the things we told you, tell other people. Um, we get many phone calls, many emails about um, 
in particular, the, the club thing? Can we charge a monthly fee and give free cannabis? Can we charge people a, a thousand rand for a shirt and then a week later they get delivered a banky? You can't do that. Um, <laughs> it's a no-no. So, yeah. Just yeah. yeah. in the line spaces as well. Uh, well, yeah, so, yeah, I uh, haven't been completely honest with you about the registration there. So, five years, sure. And the reason that takes so long is because you need clinical data, you need studies, you need evidence, you need quite a volume of stuff in order to register this medicine. Um, but there is a reliance basis, and that can save significant time. How much time, I'm not sure. Um, but what it means is that you can rely on clinical data from other countries, such as Canada, um, to prove that this medicine does what you say it does, or is capable of doing what you say it is capable of doing. So there is a reliance basis, and we can use clinical data and research from other countries to move the process along somewhat. Um, but that's in relation to a specific medicine that has been registered overseas. Yes, once again, that's not in relation to cannabis as a whole. That's in relation to a cannabis-containing medicine, or a particular strain of cannabis. Um, so there, yeah, there's really quite a legislative chokehold on the, on the whole cannabis industry right now, but I think in, over, the, over time and in the next two years, it'll, it'll gradually loosen for the better. It just has to. We can't have the constitutional court saying that it's fine for all of us to use and grow it, but then the regulatory regime behind it saying, no, this warrants the same protection and consideration as met. I mean, it, yeah. Just off the back of that, Andrew, are our authorities not also looking at uh, reducing the schedules on some con concentrations of CBD and those sorts of things. Yes, yeah, that's, like that's, that. that's, that's quite correct. Um, in the medicine, in the, the meeting we had with SAPRA and the Pharmacy Council, they were discussing, or they said discussions were going to commence about co certain concentrations of CBD in particular. Um, and what they're talking about there is whether very low concentrations can be allowed to be um, schedule zero essentially for the purposes of beauty products, your skin care um, and such things. But as soon as it's medicinal, um, I mean the conversations haven't even begun yet about uh, lowering the schedule for that. But in as much as you can, you can limit the concentration of CBD to things like beauty products, to things where they don't really have um, an inward medicinal effect, um, we're not sure what they're talking about or if they're talking about that yet. Um, but certainly there are conversations happening about CBD related beauty products, which that news might find some of you well. Yeah. Um, yes? So obviously us being a point A, I, wanting to move towards point B, yeah. you mentioned countries like Lesotho earlier and stuff like that. Yeah. I don't want to compare apples and oranges, but how does their law differ to ours? And how, not how do we get there, that's just yes. the next question, but where, what's the fundamental difference to a non-legal person? How, so, I'm not too clued up on Lesotho's laws, but I can tell you um, what happens in Lesotho is, once again, it's actually very difficult for an end user to get cannabis, and in fact, you can only get it, you can only get it uh, medicinally. Um, and there's also red tape that you have to cross in order to get that. So there's no recreational trade in Lesotho. Um, it's a similar situation whereby Canada, for example, it's a cold place. Their cannabis is all grown indoors. They've identified an opportunity there um, with cheap labor and good climate. And the government's allowed that to happen and allowed the investment to so come it's in. Really tax, like it's really just a tax. It's really just bringing foreign direct commercial. investments in, yeah. The, the, the other thing, I mean, just having <coughs> spoken to... Uh, you should, know, we, should we open this up to questions? Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. I think that's, that's the end of the presentation, so... Yes. Wanna, wanna come up. Yeah. So, so just further to that, I mean, the, the, the other thing that, that one realizes you, you know, there's nothing in any of these regulations related to our local licenses that talks about six or eight licenses or whatever it is are going to be given out. Um, not having studied the laws, but having spoken to people who have participated in those processes, it does very much seem that in a lot of those countries, there, there's been an economic case that's been made. You know, as Andrew says, they've realized that somebody from Canada has approached them and told them that that they're willing to pay you know top dollar for for this kind of thing and then they sort of make like an exception an exclusion zone and then they say so, right well we're going to be issuing eight licenses to very large scale farms and um, in order to get one of these licenses you need to put down six million US even just for us to to, to consider the license application so um, I think we're 
we're a little bit more formal than that, but at the same time, I would say probably a little bit more legitimate. You know, the, the actual license application here, although it might be very expensive to get your site master file in order, um, it's, it's not that expensive. I mean, we're talking about in the region of 20,000 Rand you know, from, from start to finish. Yeah, well, the expensive part there is actually getting your, your whole operation up to a point where you can register it. I mean, they'll, they're going to send an inspector to go through the whole operation with you. Your whole oper operation will be contained in a site master file. It's essentially your bubble, your constitution of your, your whole operation. So that Section 22C license, um, as I said, allows you to export, import, as well as cultivate. Now, it doesn't automatically give you the right to do all three. When you're applying for that, you'll create a site master file and if you want to import, that type master file will contain every single detail of your import operation, from who you're buying it from, who's um, getting it across the border, who's it given to you after that. Um, if you want to export, same thing. It's included in the site master file. If you want to cultivate, type master file. So you really have to have all of that down to a T before you apply, and they're going to send an inspector to go through that with you. So that's the expensive part, is getting your operation up to a standard where the Inspector goes through it with you and everything can be ticked off. You can't just say, I've got the best security ever, I've got the best distribution chains ever, and meanwhile there's, there's just nothing. So that's the expensive part. The actual application itself isn't really too expensive at all. Yeah. So with this site master file, you're saying that you can't apply for all three, well, you wouldn't be able to apply for all three, like the growing, processing, distributing. You can. You can. Have, all has to be contained in that document. So within your site master file, you'd have to have your GAP, which is your agricultural practices, <coughs> GMP in order, yeah. and then your GCP, I'd say. The, what's the GCP? Clinical, Clinical practices. Clinical because practices. if you're going to make a, something that's going to go for medical purposes, it has so to be. So that would be more in the re region of the, the pharmacist, the clinical practice. So when you, you're talking about growing cannabis out the ground, the actual plant, by well, the time yeah, that's no, processed, yeah, that's yeah. going to be handed over to a pharmacist. That's a separate license. You can't, as a farmer, produce your own API. So there we go. So you can't have all three, but growing, processing, and industry. Well, I mean, you can partner with a pharmacist or a pharmacist company who then is on site and is doing the extraction and processing mm. for you so that you can then... So as long as your site master file has got everything all well, the your site file would, <coughs> your, excuse me, your site master file would identify the pharmacist who you've yes, partnered with. Yes, of course. And then yeah. make your site up to spec with, like you're saying, the size of the door, whether yeah. or not there's eaves over the wall, etc. Yeah. Et yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, it's very detailed. Yeah. Has there been any mention or discussion regarding, like, for example, syntax on alcohol or tobacco? I don't think we're there yet. I mean, uh, I, I think it's a fair assumption that, that if we do get to a regulated framework that it would be in place, but, but the, the, the simple answer is that we're not there yet. We'll have to, there's a whole process that needs to happen before the legislation and regulations get put into force. It has to go to public comment. Um, and we'll see where that comes. It's a bit of an unknown at the moment. But uh, I think it's a fair assumption that if we, we moved into a regulated industry where it was publicly available, it would be yeah, subject to some sort of syntax. Even if I've done a little bit different name, go so far as to say that's the only reason it will ever be regulated is because you can tax it to us. Yeah. Well, I mean, the potential to increase the tax base is, is quite significant with an industry like this. It's something that's been outlawed for as long as it has. So I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing either. Do, do you reckon you could circumvent all of this medical thing by just growing weed that has no medical value? Because that's what they tell you for the last 70 years. You can say, I'm not growing medicine, I'm growing weed. You can, you, 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 you can, no, but the point is you can grow your own medicine. There's nothing stopping you. But so you long as it's for personal consumption, the problem is when you're yeah. now trying no, to... Unless you come to the commercialization and trying to make an industry out of it and trying to make a profit off it. In the workspace, if I carry CBD, I mean that I could use myself. Is it my private space? Will I be allowed to? Uh, I, think, I think so long as you are keeping it private. I mean, if, if, if you start taking the drops in front of people, you know, workspaces are private. Um, but, but, you know, if you, if, if you carry the, the street to work and you have produced it yourself, there ought not to be any problem with that. I mean, I've seen under the Oh, no, the CBD is not the CBD. I mean, but, but, but the point is, that it, it, it's an interesting aspect that you raised because there, there are a lot of um, labor law consequences that are now flowing from this. You know, you, I don't know if you heard recently, there were those, I think, 300 odd truck drivers who were dismissed for being under the influence of cannabis. And of course, it's impossible to tell when they smoked, whether they did it over the weekend or whether they did it on the morning of. Um, but, but there was just this presumption, and I know that the employer argued that because they're driving heavy machinery and there is the potential 
to hurt people in the process. They have to have a zero, zero tolerance policy. Um, I'm sure that's going to go through various appeals, etc. We don't have the final answer on that. But CBD, I think, I think, I think you could make a very compelling case for an unfair dismissal if you were, or, or even uh, just unfair labour practice if you were disciplined for taking that in the workplace. It's the kind of thing that you could do for pre-approval as well. Yeah. I mean, if it doesn't have any psychoactive components and it doesn't you're going to have sort of any inhibition on your mental abilities, it seems like this type of thing that you could get pre-approval also, also, at your place of work. Also, the standard, the the standard, the standard drug tests don't test for CBD, they test for THC. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, I mean, no, sure. It's, uh, if, if you obtain CBD under Section 21, that's fine. It's a, it's a registered medicine that's been brought in legally and you have a prescription yeah, for it. That's different. Yeah, once it, everything that Carl and Paul Michael just said applies then. Yeah. Sorry, on, on, on a smaller scale, um, what I'm understanding here now is um, legally I can't actually buy seeds from anybody. But I want to grow it home for myself, type of thing. Um, but what I'm still also not understanding is, the guys walk into my house and my whole land is turning into a weak point or whatever. Yeah. I mean, where do we draw the limit? Um, you know, <laughs> type of thing. I'm, I'm just sort of asking the question that, you know, um, am I safe to grow 10 plants or 20 plants or 50 plants? You know, it's, it's so difficult. You, read through this judgment now a number of times and I, n I notice something new every time I read it. But the problem is that often what I notice is contradicted by something a few paragraphs back or a few paragraphs forward. So I, I, I really think what happened here is that the judges realized that something needed to change and they've left it largely in the hands of the legislature but then there was this question, well, what, what in the next two, two years? And as much as they thought through it, you know, they didn't cover every eventuality. Uh, you know, there, there, there are there are certain absurdities. You know, if you're not allowed to buy the seeds, well, then you've either donated one of your friends has donated them to you, or somebody you know has donated them to you. But that then means that the cannabis that they grew wasn't only for personal use, because part of the cannabis was to be donated to. You. The, or the, the the other thing is that. Well, where did they get the cannabis? So did they need to possess the cannabis prior to the judgment? Which means that somewhere along the line, somewhere along the supply chain, a crime needs to be committed. And that, that could never have been the intention of the legislature. So um, I don't know if that answers your question. Well, but has, um, the, the, the one thing, look, I understand that part. Um, the one thing is, I want to know if, if the police rock up in my house and I've got five <coughs> things inside my house and I've got five different strains growing. Yeah. I can just tell the guy, well, this is for me, I'm trying all the different strands. Yes. And, 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 and technically they ought not to arrest you because there isn't an upper limit yet on it. Nobody okay. said that five plants okay. is too much or ten plants is too much. It's all objective. You know, I use that I use that analogy and again, surviving an audit, I mean film yourself ten nights in a row, smoking yourself <laughs> to a stupid just so that you can show what a heavy cannabis would be. Okay. Sure. Just got one, yeah. I just want to ask you guys, if, if you, can you grow for someone else's personal use? Because no, like, what if it's, like you say you're an expert, somebody's an expert at yeah. making beautiful cannabis, like, and they can't grow it themselves, yeah, they well, can't grow it themselves for, I don't know, space, I don't know, can you grow So what's the person? question that you're asking? Are you saying that there's one person that can grow with you people. need to help grow? Are you saying that you no, they don't stay with you. you. Can't say, can service. you grow for other people? For their personal use. Like a club. So basically, you, you allow 10 people, you yeah. register 10 people and grow for them. The, the, the judgment says cultivation of cannabis for that person, for their own personal use. But then, prior to that, and this is where I talk about these contradictions in the judgment, it also says any act associated with the cultivation of cannabis for a person's <coughs> private use. And you combine that with the fact that it says, well, you know, growing privately doesn't mean that you have to necessarily grow it at home. There are other private spaces outside of your home with, where you can grow it. So what does that mean? Does that mean that you must now rent a, a shipping container in, in town, or does it mean that you can grow at your friend's house? I would say that if we adopt the purpose of, purpose of, getting that wrong, the purpose of interpretation to the judgment, I think a prosecutor is going to find 
an uphill battle convincing a judge to prosecute your friend for drug dealing if they weren't making any money. If it's so that you live in a high rise and you don't know and you don't have green fingers and you don't have the space and you want your friend with the garden to grow for you. So what? It's also why I say it comes back to the question. If you're talking about helping a friend or a situation like that, that's one thing. But if you're speaking about offering a service to the public that you're trying to industrialize this and make a profit, you say, look, I've got this space. Anyone's welcome to come and pay me X. I'll grow you your, your cannabis and we can move forward. That's a very different question. And I answer, think the, answer that question because it's still not, you're still not pay, they're not buying, they're giving you the, they, you're growing it for them. You're not. You're not profiting off the cannabis. Okay, so I can answer it with a, with a question if I may. <laughs> you growing the cannabis for them now? Yes. Are you growing it for your own personal consumption, and your own personal use in private? <laughs> so <laughs> if, I, if, I, if I can actually premise it with this, I'm not saying that's necessarily what my views are on the topic, or I don't think that's necessarily what's right. But if you look at the judgment, that's all we've got for right now. We have the judgment, we've got, uh, you know, the legislature will be making moves in the future, and we have seen some draft prosecutorial guidelines that are making the rounds. But, but, but hypothetically, I mean, how, how in this whole investigation or stumbling upon this process do they establish who this person is growing for? I mean, unless it is this big industrial growth. Well, that's, that's what I say. <laughs> you know, if you come to my plot and it's all there, that's going to be tough to, tough to justify as, you know, personal cultivation for use in private by, <laughs> by me. <laughs> If you live in an apartment lot mm -hmm. and there's a communal say, pool area with a garden mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and you grow in that section. So it's actually something I've thought about because it's the situation that I live in. The difficulty, I mean, leave aside public versus private and who has access to it, but do children have access to that, that communal pool area and are they expected to be around there? What sort of safety controls are in place? So. Th we don't have a strict definition on what is private space, but you need to take these sorts of things into account if you're living in communal areas where, where more people than just you, you and yours, may be there. That also applies to non-consenting adults. Well, that's yeah. the point. Yeah. It's about the private space. Can we fly with weed in our bags? Yeah, we've been debating that. No, we've tried. I think it dogs a few months to adjust their senses. <laughs> Yeah. It's in a personal but, bag but, in. But, but that doesn't mean that those sniffer dogs aren't still there and that these people think that you're not allowed to. And I mean, the other thing you must bear in mind is, is what, what the, the fine print on the, on the ticket says. It, of course, it might, up be, to the company. It might be that you're contravening the actual airlines. Uh, I think you must also remember what Paul Michael said during, during his portion of the talk earlier. It's one thing to be arrested, it's a different thing to get a criminal conviction. So whether you'll be fine at the end of the day, in all likelihood, yes. But that may not prevent you from being arrested and going through that trauma. It's not a nice experience as anyone who's gone through it will tell you. It's not gonna not gonna get you out of that. Um, thank you. <laughs> Firstly I think on behalf of everyone this is fantastic. Yes. So thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. I'd just like to um, bring it back to in terms of licenses and grey areas. We touched on grey areas uh, earlier. And I know there's a few dispensaries that are operating um, already publicly as well as advertising and uh, under a traditional healer practice. So according to the Traditional Healers pra uh, Practitioners Act, a traditional healer is allowed to prescribe cannabis. It falls under their indigenous plant system. So how does that come into play with like the MCC now? Because if, if it's easier to go that route and not apply for any licenses and then become a traditional healer, then you, you, you wouldn't have to pay six million dollars and do this and do that and whatnot. You just register yourself as a healer. You can then grow it and cultivate it and, and prescribe it. So I just wanted to find, you know, is, is, that, is, is that a gray area? Is that a, a better uh, like, you know, angle to take? Or? Are there, are there, I don't think we have a clear answer for you. Do you maybe know what, 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 the, what the criteria are to be a, a, a traditional healer? Does it, does it require registration in and of itself? I mean, isn't there, isn't there an association of traditional healers? So, um, not personally. I don't know. I, I, you know so I, I, my point being that I really doubt that the pop-up store in Sanson City is run, run by a resident sure, sure. woman. You know, yeah. so. Yeah. You, know, you can. There, there are certainly 
loopholes, and I'll always fall back on that, that concept of in Freudum ledgers, yeah. you're trying too hard. And it's going to, there's a lot of people who might get away with it for a long time until somebody doesn't. And, and, until somebody wakes up to the fact that this is not only a crime in terms of the Drugs Act, it's a crime in terms of the Medicines Act, the Pharmacy Act, you know, there's, you're contravening multiple pieces of legislation and then, you know, the hawks decide to, to raid your place and then you're in the local KZN newspapers and... What happens if Parliament doesn't make any rules in the next two years? Then the present situation persists. It, 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 says, it says that much. It says that much in the in the judgment. Um, here's a question from the live stream. Um, if somebody gives me their plant and I do an extraction of it, can I charge for the extraction? As a service, you know that's it's an interesting one. It is an interesting. One. Uh, I, we've 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 come across this question before. Our opinion, and and remember that our opinion is only worth the paper that it's written on when it comes to that arrest and prosecution. But you're not taking any cannabis from them and leaving with it. You're not giving them any cannabis that they didn't have before. So what are you doing? You're actually providing a service. You're not selling them cannabis. So I would. I would say that that's probably all right. Okay, well, I'm sure they're watching and listening. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you own a venue or an event um, which people pay tax for or entrance for, yes. um, and you just allow them to smoke, does that seem as your private space or is it a public space? I think, I think you know, if it's, if it's one of those access only, you know, um, the, the person's fully alive to the fact that, uh, that this is a cannabis event and that cannabis, so you firstly need the consent because it needs to be around consenting adults. Um, and if the only people who could access that event at that time, and remember this includes staff, eh? um, the only people who could access that event were people who were so-called members or, or temporary members who were accessing that for purposes of partaking in cannabis smoking, probably fine. But from a labor law perspective, a workplace is not a private space for the very reason that, you know, it's not, it's not your private space. There's members of the public and there's cleaning staff, etc., etc. So you would need consent and, from those people? Well, you know, you, you also need to be careful about consent. You know, is it, is it one of those things where you only get the job if... Uh, yeah. so it's, it's no, a, but if it's done fairly, on No, if it's... If, if you it's, got if, to sign something? If it's done fairly, look, I mean, this is, this, this is really the point, is that if you... If you make, make it that they know exactly what they're getting themselves in for and you've got a very strict policy at the door and you make sure that nobody else can get in and that there is no public access. And is it a condition of the employment? What yeah. happens if, what happens if one of the staff members says, I'm actually not comfortable with that? Yeah. <coughs> you see, uh, it'll be very difficult then to... to, to so we all have a right. If I run a joint now and everyone just says, okay, let's do it, everyone, including you. Well, we, we, we wouldn't tell anyone, but it wouldn't be allowed. It's very technical, but, it, but, but it's, it comes from a, a place of labor law, that, that a place of employment is, yeah, and, and I mean, what, what, what did our invite say? Educating the public as to SA's cannabis law, so you chaps all member of, members of the public when you came in here today. Um, sorry, I know it's had his hand up for a mm -hmm. uh, I just actually want to ask back, uh, just back to the seeds. So, hemp seeds are being sold for nutrition. I mean, you can buy them in this game. Yes. So, just now you have this nice cheese, and you're selling these three seeds for, for nutrition. I mean, they're packed full of essential fatty acids. <laughs> Would that be a little... <laughs> Those seeds in the disc game are terminated, yeah? They're not live seeds. Well, so they well, say. Well, but so they say, but we, you know, one in three. And it comes come back yeah. to the, the Latin term he's been throwing around, this in Fraudum Legus. It's, yeah. it's probably not going to be okay, no. Yeah. Look, no matter how many essential I'm fatty acids are in there. <laughs> 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 no, you know, that's, 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 that's the thing, I mean. Do they, do they have such high quality fatty acids that you can sell for three for a thousand rand? Um, no, but 900 is. Just as far as growing, I don't have a place to grow where I live, but could we have 10 guys together and 
having different strains. We can grow, this is 10 guys, our club, only for us, whatever comes out of it is for our purpose. Is that possible? So we, we, we get this question a lot. Um, if you're talking about commercializing something like that, if you want to be, for example, a body corporate that leases land out and then people grow on their portion of land, that's a bit more tricky and most probably illegal. But if you guys, as 10 mates, for example, come together on your land, plant your weed and take steps to ensure that my weed is separate from his weed. This is my personal stash, this is his personal stash, and you, know, you fence that off. Take steps to ensure that <coughs> it's still yours and that you're not profiting from it, then sure. And that you're able to show that. And that you're able to show that. And that's what we spoke about the order trail earlier. I mean, it's as in vi video yourself planting your own weed. And, and, have, and have like a clear contract between the ten of you that this these this four square meters is mine and that six square meters is yours and don't you come and take four square meters. <laughs> 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 so, 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 so yeah, if you're talking about solving a problem of, of no space and having a space that's not yours, then sure, but if you're talking about commercializing it and having hectic and then inviting thousands of people to sign a lease agreement, and then saying that you're gonna sell it to them, then sure, but if you're talking about having hectic and then inviting thousands of people to sign a lease agreement and then sell it to them, then sure, but if you're talking about commercializing it and having hectic what about playing your games like uh, yeah. cannabis cups, <coughs> part time cannabis cups for the breeders and personal growers? What about them? Uh, Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. to host them, sure. Are you, are, you, are you, is there any, is there any cannabis changing hands? For money? Uh, mm. No, but for, uh, for, for the judges, yes. Uh, for the judges. Yeah, look. It's, 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 it's great because, I mean, it's, it seems reasonably clear from the judgment that it, it didn't say that the person needs to be alone. So, obviously, the judges are contemplating the fact that people are going to get together and share cannabis. You know, that's, and, and that's really what's happening there, is they're getting together and sharing cannabis. But as soon as, um, you know, you also need to be careful what happens there. You know, it's, it's, it's a place that's ripe for you know, under under the counter drug deals and that sort of thing. And you don't want some undercover person exposing that and then you as the organizer of the event go down for, for allowing that. that so, sort of thing. so what I would think there is if you were going to do something like that, the cannabis would have to be weighed, it would have to be kept separate from everything and then brought out by you as your own cannabis for a testing sample. Just brainstorming this. And if there are steps to taken to ensure that the only cannabis on that premise yeah, like was that the being, was that that I brought and then being judged. Um, I'd I'd have a tough day in court to put some jail for that. But I mean if everyone's just bringing their weed in and everyone in the audience is smoking and there's a free for all, that's a problem. So with ideas like this, the more controlled you can get it, the more you can confine someone's weed to them. No fine use. Yeah. Okay. So the more steps you take to ensure that my weed is my weed and your weed is your weed and we're in a private place and no children blah blah blah, then the more legal it starts to look. But the more of a free for all it becomes, then you should be white. Yeah. Sorry, excuse my stupidity now. I'm not going to ask the same question again, but hypothetically you making a cheese ball and you crust it with this <coughs> MC that you can buy from this game. <coughs> and you do a catered adventure, for example, and there's a tray of cheese balls coated in this hemp crust. Sounds delightful. <laughs> <laughs> but what's the question? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so I mean, because you're supplying, you're selling it to a person who's going to pay you for that food. Uh -huh. well, and you can advertise it as such as well, obviously. You wouldn't but just supply it. Well, well, yeah. Once again, that, that falls. If it's processed hemp, it's processed not it's containing full seeds. But then at least it's not all seeds, because they all they also sell like crushed seed, yeah. it can be ground into a flour, yeah. it, it can become a processed product. And was it lawfully obtained? Yes. I mean, you've said it's come through Diskin, but mm -hmm. uh, I think a large portion of it would be whether it was lawfully obtained. Well, because, because you, you can't make any sort of profits of unlawful activity, and that's not even a principle that's speaking about cannabis now, that's just general. Yeah, it was an ordinary commercial PTY limited mm -hmm. that we procured it through. Yeah. Look, I mean, there's a question mark as to as to whether this whole I mean health stores have been selling the, the cannabis seeds for what decades now. Um, whether strictly speaking in terms of the law they were entitled to do that, or whether they always just did and it was so absurd to hit them under those laws that it never happened. Well we, we haven't found anything other than that which deals with with hemp seeds and the fact that you've got the whole plant or any part thereof. I think what honestly happened with that was that people recognized that it was non-psychoactive and there was this whole, what did you call it, what was the term of sterilizing them or 
Uh, termination. Termination. Yeah. That's, that, that, that's supposed to be terminated. And I think people just gave up trying to, to stop that sort of thing because it was so absurd. Um, but, and, and that speaks to the fact that there probably is no drive to prosecute you for anything like that. But whether it's strictly speaking legal under the law, probably not. And also, some of the CBD oil is the extraction process they use, like alcohol <coughs> and stuff like that. So, I mean, it's, some of it can be harmful to people. So hence why, if you sell it, it has to be medical, and there are all those mm -hmm. controls in place. Yeah. I mean, uh, but these guys are selling stuff that's not. Yeah, so, what you know, you all the health shops. A lot of the, the health shops and the yeah. CBD you find in there, um, if you look carefully, it's actually just processed hemp oil. Not all of it's actually CBD. CBD. They just say CBD, but it says hemp. Yeah, it's and the CBD that is being sold is not legally sold at the moment. I mean, that's the, the long and the short of it, is that it's not lawful to have a pop-up shop and sell CBD products in the manner that it's being done at the moment. Or to even advertise it. Sure. There was that recent thing with the Durban Poison beer that was <coughs> bought out by the big company. Yeah. And they were having issues about the fact they named their product after, like we have Roy Boston, South Africa. Yeah. Can you give us a bit of the poor? Um, so yeah, the, the proprietor, that's, you're talking about intellectual property law there. Um, unfortunately, Caitlin is not here to speak on that. But, um, so Look, I'd be lying if I said I even knew the facts of that issue. Look, I, 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 I would be referring to. You know, some, somebody might have a proprietary right to the name Durban Poison, but whether they could register that right specifically in relation to cannabis is questionable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So. Yeah. It wasn't related to like a genus of a plant name. You can't name something after something that's... But the point is that's not a scientific name. Durban yeah. poison is something that people well, have just called it for a number of years. But, but, but what, I, what I can tell you is that from, a, from a, um, an intellectual property perspective, you do struggle to register terms where the, the origin of it uh, factors into the name. So, so, so you know, you can't, you, know, you can't all of a sudden claim to 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 own the rights to anything from Durban. It just doesn't, it doesn't work. <laughs> so, um, that, that, that that might have been a bit. I suppose we need to actually yeah, study what to look into. Yeah, that needs to look into the same. Swazi gold, gold, Malawi gold, yeah. Durban poison, yeah. and Afghan Kush. Yeah. All of that you couldn't essentially name yeah. anything yeah. after that. Well, uh, quite the opposite is what you say. I think, I think you wouldn't be able to protect those rights just yet. You wouldn't be able to own the right to the name Malawi Gold or yeah. Swazi Gold. Firstly, because you can't say that now everything that has the word Swazi or Malawi or Durban in is, you know, you're infringing my trademark now. So uh, we don't, I don't think it's a protectable intellectual and, property. And, 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 just, and just to get even, even nerdier, the, 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 the fact that you call it gold is a, is a demarcation of quality, yeah. which, is also, which is also, you know, the, you couldn't call it like Durban's best, for example. So Malawi gold, yeah, there's an association of quality. It's associated false advertising. With, it could be that the whole name um, is, it's, is yeah. not registrable. It's actually very rare that the components of a name for, for weed are like unique. I mean, there will be some kind of region and they'll be named after a person or Saudi. Or what am I going to Well, in the States, the, the company Gorilla Glue sued the, the guys naming their strange Gorilla Glue because they have a glue company. Gorilla <laughs> 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 yeah. Glue, yeah. And they sold America's a diff yeah. different place to litigate yeah. in. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I know we might have touched on this earlier, but we know it's still illegal for a financial transaction to happen between money and, and marijuana. Uh, but Two, two things I'd like to find out. Uh, if someone is unable to grow their own for their personal use, and they have a friend do it for free, so there's no financial transactions, is that allowed? And secondly, are you allowed to trade <coughs> marijuana strands? Yeah. So if, if I'm growing a specific strand for myself for personal use, and you are growing a specific strand, and I'd like to try that, we do a, a, a trade exchange. So there's no financial gain anywhere. It's just this one might have higher CBD, as mine has higher THC, whatever the case would be. Is, there, is that legal? This, this guides you a little bit. Um, it talks about uh, it's inconsistent with the right to privacy, and then it says, in constitutionally invalid, to the extent, so this is the DOE provision, prohibit the cultivation of cannabis by an adult in private for his or her personal consumption in private. So that's quite, and then you actually go to the definition of deal in. Um, and it talks about cultivation, etc. I think, but this is, you know, it talks about supply, and it doesn't, supply doesn't say 
Well, tree, well, that, I would it, think. it doesn't say for money, yeah, but you yeah. see, again, you, you, it, it, it comes down to semantics. What, what was meant here? But I, I speak about there being contradictions in the judgment. You know, it, it says personal consumption by that individual in private, but then they say the private spaces might be outside of your own home. So that, that contemplates that you might be going to yeah. somebody else's private space so long yeah. as they're consenting. I, I don't see that the intentions of the Constitutional Court judges were to prevent people from sharing. Sure. Um, yeah. Also because that means that only people who were possessed of cannabis plants prior to the judgment could, yeah. could then enforce the, the, the right to grow cannabis. Otherwise, how else do you get the seeds if not through, if not through sharing? Barter, though, is a form of exchange. Yeah. So it doesn't need to be, you know, randellas that change hands in order for, uh, for it to be... It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't help. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, that said, I, I think it would be a tough day in court for a prosecutor if he's trying to arrest you for freely giving <coughs> seeds to someone. It's the only way that, as I said, if I can give you, if I can give you, if I can give you, if I can give you an analogy. Sure. If you go to the bottle store and you go home and you throw a dinner party and you give all of your friends the wine that you bought, you don't need a liquor license for that. Mm. You are you are sharing your and 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 you know it says it says here. Sorry, let's go back to this. These are her personal consumption. You see, there they use the word consumption, but other parts of the of the judgment use the word use. Mm. Now. Use could be to grow a hedge. Use could be to entertain your friends. <laughs> you see what I'm saying when I say that it's very hard to pick, to pick through the judgment and to give you very clear answers because it says one thing here, it says something there, and then you, you sort of rely on which which suits you better, but, but the contrary might suit the prosecutor better. If you sell a product that's made of cannabis, that legal? What kind of a product are you to compare it to then? A cookie, a brownie, a brownie. Yeah, it's a little. <laughs> that's the same as selling a, a <laughs> bag, as so far as the law is concerned. So you make, you make the butter. See, I'm, I'm using yes. cannabis. Yeah. I make the butter. Yes. Yeah. So I have now something else to do with the butter. Yeah. So can I not share it with someone? So you're asking if you can share it or sell it? <laughs> Are you looking to make a business or are you no, no. If I'm having a party and I've got a whole lot of cannabis, mm. I can't get into trouble if I've got cookies, I've got liquor, I've got all these things of cannabis. I think the scale is going to be quite important there. So I think I misunderstood your question at the beginning. I thought you were asking, can I start selling cookies and no. brownies? Can I start making a business? I the answer for that is, is quite clearly no. Um, but if, the, if you've got a, a dessert at home that's been prepared in a room full of consenting adults, I don't see the issue there. Consenting. 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 I'm not surprised they'd be like, well. <laughs> you see, there's, there's serious criminal, criminal ramifications for, you know, for putting something in sneakily. Sorry, so, so literally you basically go tell everybody it's going to be dope with your body. Somebody's going to party's going to be dope. Yes, yes. Well, they don't have to smoke. Just, 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 just. Smokers to consent. I mean, they can let you do it. If you look at this, if you look at this paragraph, I mean, this, this, this has the, this has those contradictions within the same paragraph. You see, it talks about for personal use or personal consumption, but of course, use is far wider a concept than consumption. Which, which do you prefer and which did the judges mean? I mean, short of a test case, we don't actually know exactly what the judges mean, meant unless, they, unless they, 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 they wrote it, which they didn't. Yeah. So all these nuances and stuff, we'll, we'll have clarity on them once there are test cases. We need some brave individuals to go forth and try their luck. And then Although we discourage it. Actively <laughs> discourage it. Yeah. Actively discourage it. That's, that's for the live feed. Eventually, yeah. <laughs> Eventually, we're gonna, that's, how, that's how the law is going to be refined and understood better. Um, yeah, so I mean, you're free to stay for a drink afterwards. Thank you for coming, and we can, we can have any other discussions. And thank, thank, you, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.